Hello and welcome to this index event. Um, today we are going to be discussing should same-sex relationships be promoted. Um, there's been a lot in the news recently with regards to uh, especially the Winter Olympics and the laws in Russia but also there's been a recent law passed in Nigeria um, where any public show of uh, same-sex affection or organisations can land someone in jail for 14 years. So we thought it was quite a topical event that we could get people involved with today. So joining us today we have got Brian Pello, who is the Director of Global Strategy and Religious Freedom Editor at the Religion News Service, and Joel Bedos, who is International Coordinator of the International Day Against Homophobia. So to kick things off, could you just sort of give us a general overview on your thoughts on whether you do think same-sex relationships should be promoted or not? I decided to argue no. And because I decided to argue no, I decided to prepare my response. Because when I said that on Twitter and Facebook yesterday, um, I got a lot of very confused and some angry messages back. So I thought I should be very precise in what I'm saying. Um, so forgive me if I slip into reading a bit, but um, it's just better than me screwing up what I actually mean. So to, to talk about the question specifically, should we promote same-sex relationships? I have a problem with the question for two reasons. Um, the words we and promote. I'm not quite sure who we is in this question. Um, I don't know if we meant human rights groups, all states, human beings, the media. Uh, if we're talking about index on censorship specifically, which I think maybe we were, um, I think that index should be in the business of promoting freedom of expression, which it is. And love is obviously part of freedom of expression, um, as is same-sex love. And index should be promoting the freedom to express one same-sex attraction and the freedom to express same-sex relationships. But I don't think they should be promoting specific structures like same-sex relationships themselves. I'll talk about the other we's, like I mentioned um, later on. But that brings me to the second question, which is what do we mean by promote? When I hear promote, and I'm sure when many people hear it, it implies a certain degree of advocacy and actual coercion. When people oppose to same-sex relationships, specifically same-sex marriage, here promote, they often hear this coercion as attempted conversion. And in the US, we've seen this around opposition to sexual education classes, including mentions of same-sex activities and relationships. And I'd argue to the same degree we've seen it, this idea, this fear of co conversion, sexual conversion, playing out in Catholic schools in the US recently that have fired administrators for marrying their same-sex partners. Now that I work on religious freedom issues specifically, I understand this, um, this fear in a different way, this fear of conversion and coercion in a different way, and, and maybe where it comes from. So if the question were, should we promote Christianity? Should we promote a very specific institution? I'd have the same questions about who is meant by we and, and also what is meant by promote. In the religious context, this usually means re religious conversion, which is even stronger. But back to the question specifically of promoting same-sex relationships. So if, if a male friend came to me who identifies as straight, he'd been on a few bad dates and said, I don't know what to do, I wouldn't probably say maybe you should try dating another man unless he indicated that's something he wanted to do. Basically, people I don't think should be forced into situations that they don't want to be in, which is that idea of co coercion. Um, when we're talking about promoting same-sex relationships, which again is this very specific structure, they assume that this means encouraging same-sex relationships that might not have otherwise existed like converting people to engage in same-sex activity or to enter same-sex relationships. And this might sound absurd, but it's what people hear and what a lot of people think, and I don't think it's what LGBT activists are trying to do. So just more to the point, I think human rights groups, states, whatever actors we're talking about, human beings, should be in the business of promoting acceptance and tolerance for all kinds of human difference, which includes LGBTQI identities and activities, and promoting the freedom to express those identities but I don't think they should be in the business of promoting relationships themselves. Um, when I go back to that question of who is we, and we're talking about states, which I think we are when we're talking about Nigeria, I definitely don't think states should be in the business of promoting any type of romantic relationship. I don't think governments should be drawing boxes around how people choose to express themselves and their love, or sanctioning boundaries around acceptable identities in that regard. Uh, now that I've worked on freedom of expression issues for so long, I think my views are pretty laissez-faire on these kind of issues. And um, at the end of the day, same-sex relationships don't hurt or demean heterosexual relationships. Um, if we're looking at specific legislature, I, I know you mentioned Nigeria. 
Then there's also Uganda, where it's a crime to promote homosexuality. And you mentioned Russia, which now bans the pr propaganda of non-traditional sexual relation to minors. I don't think activists should be using this language of oppressive states, like the words promote, promote homosexuality, when I don't think it's what they actually mean. But Joel, you can correct me or elaborate on that when we get to it. I don't think homosexuality needs to be promoted, but what needs to be promoted are rights, freedoms, human dignity, these basic things, not so much sex or specific sexual structures like same-sex relationships. Um, being gay and in a same-sex relationship is not the same as promoting homosexuality. I don't think people are promoting heterosexuality just by being open about their sexual orientation and in heterosexual relationships. I think that they're just, in that case, living with authenticity. So just to sum up my views and to let Joel come in, very basically, I don't think we should be in the business of promoting specific types of relationships. It should be about tolerance and acceptance of difference and expression of ideas and identities rather than specific structures. And just really to summarize what I think, if your actions are directly hurting someone else, not just offending their sensibilities, but actually causing injury, you should be free to do whatever you want. Thank you, Brian. Um, so, Joel, what are your thoughts on promoting uh, same-sex relationships? Do you take the same line as Brian, or have you got a slightly different view? No, thanks. I mean, Brian, I, I think our views are very close, definitely. I think, you know, I sort of totally agree with you on many points, and I think your way of framing the issue is really right. Uh, there's two things. Obviously, harming is a red line. So we're going to talk maybe about this again when we talk about freedom of speech and freedom of having different points of views, and which obviously is you know part of the basic freedom of expression. But you just have to know when you're hurting people beyond what what is you know said to be acceptable in a society. But anyway, I think you're really right on everything. The only thing I would like to say is is to come back on the promote. What do you mean by promoting? And obviously behind there, if you're talking about promotion, I think Brian, you said it really well. Is this fantasy of conversion, you know, conversion, coercion, which rhymes with perversion. And it, it obviously is a big fantasy out there. When you listen to all the discourses in Nigeria and in Russia, it's all about people, you know, gays and lesbians and trans going out to persuade people to join the club or whatever. I mean, we're not even going to talk about whether it's, you know, whether it's real or whether it's a fantasy. I mean, it, it is obviously such a fantasy that you really have to ask yourself why is that so strong in people's minds? I mean, you're not going to make, you're not going to change any people's sexual, sexual attraction just by talking to them. I mean, it is so obviously, uh, it's it's such a fantasy. It's so daft that you really want to know why it's. So there's this whole academia around the fact that it is it is an illness. You know, like um, homosexuality is. An illness, and as an, as every illness, it's contagious. So I think it is very much rooted within this ground, you know, this fundamental belief that it is an illness and a perversion. This is why, for example, the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia that I work on has set itself on May 17th because it is the anniversary date of when the WHO declassified homosexuality as an illness, and that is so fundamentally important because around the world, many people think it's still you know, still think that it is, and so they think that it can be transmitted because it is fundamentally irrationally contagious. So once you've done away with that, and uh, why, why do you want to, why do you want to, why do you want to promote things? So if you say promoting, what is being, sorry, let me, what is being meant by promoting in all these laws that we're talking about in Russia and stuff is just the mention of it. It's just to talk about it. It is just to say, for example, I'm gay or I'm a lesbian. And that is considered as being a promotion. Now, why would that be? Is telling the truth, is just stating a simple fact, is that a willful promotion of something? And why would it be? How are people, why are people being so defensive about the fact that even to say something can be mentioned, can be existing, is already undermining their own identity and their own space. So there's a whole big thing about that that I don't really know the answer of. But I mean, the, the answer is very, very obviously promoting doesn't mean anything. If if you're talking about if you're talking about people going out and say gay to be gay or being lesbian or being transgender is the best thing and you can't be any happier than if you you know but that doesn't exist nobody says that what people say is like okay I'm gay and I think that I've got a right you know to be happy and I am happy and my family is okay and stuff so 
you know, how does that harm other people? And I really, really don't specifically know why people are being so defensive about it. The last thing I want to say about this is it's also about balancing. When you're promoting something, it's also because you might say that you need to have a positive balancing out. I mean, there's so many bad things and so much stigma and stereotyping on LGBT people that at some stage, some institutions like Index or government or an NGO and stuff might say, okay, we have to get the balance a bit right because so, so much bad things are being said that you also want to say a few good things. And if that act of balancing out is called promotion or propaganda, I really would also like to question how much promoting of you know, of heterosexual love and relationship is there. I mean, every single ad is a promotion of heterosexuality. Every, every two seconds when you go out, just look out of the window, everything is a promotion of heterosexual relationships. So would you want to get every discourse about every kind of relationship out of, the, uh, out of the public sphere? That seems impossible. You have to talk about love and relationship because all, it's political also to be in love is political. If you want to be in love with someone of the same race or the same color or a different color or whatever, everything is very strongly political and everybody's got the right to talk about it and if they feel they have to balance it out, it can be called promotions. But again, it's a matter of playing on the words, I think, more than anything. That's my feeling. Um, I mean, we've uh, obviously everyone's touched briefly on Russia, and it has been in the news a lot. Um, so that anti-propaganda laws have meant that young people uh, can't be around anything that's related to homosexuals. So whether it's taught in school or um, pamphlets or anything on the TV. So, um, and that's obviously promoting same-sex relationships in a very negative light. Uh, do you think that what obviously what Russia's doing? Is right, or should should children have access to this education? I mean, in terms of freedom of expression, these children in Russia aren't able to express themselves freely. They're not allowed to even talk to their peers, from what I understand about about the matter. Um, so, Joel, what are your thoughts on on Russia? Well, according to any international laws, I mean, according to any international convention, be you know the. Declaration of Human Rights, rights Convention of the Rights of the Child, I mean every single document says that this is beyond the red line, that children have a right not just to express themselves but also to receive information. So again, if just receiving honest, straightforward information about facts and figures without any discourse about values and stuff, just saying it exists, people live this way, this is where you can meet them and that's it. If that is not allowed, then it is such an obvious restriction on the fundamental rights of the child that I can't really, you know, I, I mean, I, I mean, I'd be interested to see if, if some people can really defend that. Brian, you obviously work for a religious news organization now, and religion possibly plays a part in what's been going on in Russia. Um, religious, sort of all religions are usually seen as sort of can be perceived as being anti-gay institutions. So how do you think the promoting of religious views affects the freedom of expression for same-sex couples? Um, do you think people in a same-sex relationship can also be open about their religion? Or do you think there's effects on what they can say? Do they have to pick one over the other? I, well, I'd, I'd, first of all, I'd say that I, I, I need to say that not, not all religions are anti-gay. Um, and that there are gay people of religion um, that do find ways to navigate um, difficult or difficulties or problems or maybe contradictions between doctrine and between living out their faith and their faith communities. Um, I think an interesting thing, because I'm now working on religious freedom, and I was obviously working on freedom of expression when I was working at Index, because that's what Index does. Uh, religious freedom has become a very politicized term in a way that I don't think freedom of expression necessarily has. And increasingly in the US especially we're seeing a notion of religious freedom uh, being used to sort of oppose same-sex relationships and oppose same-sex marriage rights and that sort of thing. And that's been an interesting thing to, to watch because religious freedom, when you think about the difference between religious freedom and freedom of expression, Religious freedom is often sort of what's inside. So it's your beliefs, your conscience, your thoughts, 
what you keep hidden. But then religion itself is obviously a form of expression. It's this outward expression. It's an association. It's grouping together, coming to a house of worship or a place of worship. Um, and to see religious freedom, which in many ways is freedom of expression, being used against you know, freedom of sexual expression, I find to be problematic, but also very interesting politically to see how that's playing out in the States. Um, uh, from Index's point of view, it, you can promote same-sex relationships in a, in a positive way in the lights of like um, laws, when it's written into laws that you, know, you can't discriminate against homosexuals. So um, what my examples were was that in the state of New Mexico, wedding photographers have been told that they can't refuse to um, shoot at a, a gay couple's wedding and there's been cases where bakeries have refused to bake cakes for um, same-sex couples and they could face time in prison. But So flipping that on the other way around, um, if, if it's written into law to promote same-sex relationships, does that then stop people having negative opinions from expressing themselves that they don't agree with this? This is an interesting thing playing out in Ireland as well with um, Panty Bliss, the drag queen who was uh, on the radio show and called some people homophobic and then there was this big outrage about whether homophobic, the term homophobia itself is hate speech. Um, yeah, there's stifling of expression from all aspects of this issue, whether people are opposed to same-sex marriage or in favor of it, expression is being stifled. What do you want to add, Joel? Well, I always want... I mean, when these debates open up, I think it always tells a big story if you... I mean, it makes things much clearer if you compare it to race. Same thing with race. I mean, would a bakery be allowed not to sell a cake to a black person because this person just feels, you know, that black people shouldn't be around? Which is, you know, people have a right not to like black people. I mean, you know... Uh, do they have a right not to sell a cake to a black person? Uh, you know, this is where the law comes in. The law, I mean, about everywhere in the world, I mean, has ruled that you can't. I mean, you know, if you don't like black people and you don't want to sell cakes to black people or to Jewish people, then don't open a bakery, right? Or open a, you know, or make it a club, a bias club. So, you know, people, you know, join a club and it's a white-only club, whatever, if that's allowed, maybe not, but you can, you know, you can find ways around it. And then you can congregate with amongst white people and eat cake among white people. But if you have a shop, then, you know, you normally, I mean, it depends again on the law of the country, but normally you're obliged to sell whoever, if, you, if you're public, then you're obliged to sell to people who enter your shop. You can't you know, tell people, no, you, I don't like your face, you're going out, or I don't like your beliefs, or you're Jewish, so just get out of my shop. Um, so you know, people have got the right not to like or not to agree. That is something, and they've got the right to say it. But have they got the right to act accordingly and to discriminate? This is when you know, discrimination laws come in. And very, you know, for a long time in the US, I mean, there was, a, you know, there was an apartheid policy. There was a, you know, a segregation policy. And there were lots of shops where it was written, you know, we don't sell to black people. Now, what people say is we should have these things with we don't sell to gay people because we don't like them. And just a, a final brief thought from both of you. What do you think the future holds um, for same-sex couples in terms of freedom of expression, um, you can either look at it on a, on a global scale or on a country-specific outlook. Um, so, Brian. Well, what does the future hold? In the US, there has been sort of a shifting tide towards legalizing these relationships, but if you look in Oregon, for instance, the ballot initiative that's going to be coming up, I think, in October, um, we talk about legalizing gay marriage, but also what you were talking about in New Mexico and Colorado, um, allowing businesses to opt out of catering those marriages. So I think that this sort of, I don't know what you want to call it, but this pull between promoting the ability to have same-sex relationships, but also the ability of groups, often religious groups, not to have to participate in those relationships will continue for quite a while. And also um, internationally, I mean, there's been new laws coming out of well, Malawi, Nigeria, Russia, this is an issue that's ongoing um, in terms of stifling expression around same-sex relationships, but also in terms of stifling the activity itself. So I think that that will probably continue, and 
yeah, this will be an issue of debate. We could have a very similar debate in 10 years. You will, I mean, religious groups will be a strong, um, will be a very important place for people to defend their religious belief, but they have to be obviously separate from state laws. So if, obviously, you know, there's going to be a lot of religious groups who don't want to celebrate and who don't want to be part of gay weddings, for example, which is absolutely normal, and, you know, they're absolutely free to do that. But they are religious groups. They're not civil bakeries, for example, which is, are just called, you know, your neighborhood bakery, and then behind there, there is a religious organization or a religious group or just a religious person dealing with this on a religious basis. So it's, it's a different thing, and I think what the future holds is a strong separation between these two elements. I just want to briefly um, say and clarify, I think we talked about religion for obvious reasons in a lot of these contexts, but it's not just religious groups that are you know, encouraging this kind of um, hatred or fear of same-sex relationships. In Russia, for instance, the country's not overwhelmingly religious. It's, it's very much a social issue that's playing out, as well as the government now quite tied to the church there. Um, but let's not delude ourselves into thinking this is just a problem of religious communities. Uh, many groups uh, have similar feelings for different motivations. There's been a lot of very interesting points said today, so I'd just like to firstly say thank you both to Brian Pello and Joel Bedos for joining us here thank this you. afternoon. Um, hopefully it's got you guys out there thinking a bit differently about things. Um, if you'd like to join in the conversation, you can use the hashtag on Twitter, love and F-E-X or you can follow Index on Censorship at Index Censorship.